Welcome, and thank you all so much for joining the Burnbound Women's Leadership Network this evening for our book talk on Ladies Get Paid, The Ultimate Guide to Breaking Barriers, Owning Your Worth, and Taking Command of Your Career. We're so thrilled to welcome author Claire Wasserman in conversation with Kathy Kramer, who is an NYU Law trustee and alumna from the class of 1988. The Burnbound Women's Leadership Network at NYU School of Law works to remedy gender inequities in the legal profession through innovative leadership training and conversations like these. So tonight we're so grateful to have Claire Wasserman and Kathy Kramer joining us. And this book is about so much more than salary negotiation. It's about advocating for yourself and how important it is to believe you're worthy of advocacy and of strategically building a career that works for you. So before I turn it over to Kathy to get us started, a few logistics. If you haven't read Ladies Get Paid yet, you can find a link to purchase the book on your website and in the chat. We will be taking questions via the Q&A box, so please submit your questions and we'll get to as many as we can. Automatic captioning is available for this event. If you wish to access the captions, please click the closed captioning button at the bottom of your screen. And now to introduce our wonderful and esteemed panelists, and Kathy Kramer, our moderator tonight, is the CEO of Legal Information for Families Today, otherwise known as LIFT. She is a nonprofit leader and attorney with a wide range of experience across private and public sectors, including service as the executive director of the New York Interschool Association and the Faculty Diversity Search, which works to increase faculty diversity, strengthen connections with public institutions, and advance innovative educational programming across independent schools in New York City. She previously worked in the New York City Council President's Office and for the New York City Board of Education. She was the chair of the Board of Directors of Planned Parenthood of New York City, and she is currently serving on the Executive Committee of the Board of Sanctuary for Families, which is a wonderful nonprofit. Uh, she is a graduate of Harvard College and NYU School of Law, where we're so grateful for her service on the Board of Trustees and for her service tonight as our moderator. So Claire Wasserman, our author tonight, is an educator, author, and founder of Ladies Get Paid, a global community that champions the professional and financial advancement of women. She is also the host of John Hancock's podcast, Friends Who Talk About Money. She has traveled the country, teaching thousands of women how to negotiate millions of dollars in raises, start businesses, and advocate for themselves in the workplace. A highly sought after expert for Fortune 500 companies, working to improve diversity, equity, and inclusion, Claire was named one marquee who's who's 75 most influential financial leaders of 2021, as well as Entrepreneur Magazine's 100 Most Powerful Women. She has spoken from everywhere from Harvard Business School to Facebook to NASA and the United Nations and has appeared on Good Morning America and in the New York Times, among others. So it's a very big thrill to have her here with us at the BWN tonight. So with that, I will turn it over to Kathy to get us started. And thank you both so much for being here. Well, thank you so much for having us. And uh, I'm thrilled to be here because even though I'm farther along in my career, you always learn things. And, and that's what I love about sort of having a particular mindset. There's always more to learn. And I wanted to say to Claire how much I enjoyed reading the book. I, I told you that already. I was a little worried. It was more like homework. It ended up being so much fun, learned a lot, loved the individual stories, and we'll, we'll get into it. But Claire, do you want to start by telling us like how the book came about and how it relates to the larger organization that you're involved with? And then sure. we'll get into lots of specifics. And thanks, thanks for having me. Um, so I, gosh, it's like you ask, how did this begin? It's like, how far back do we want to go here? Yeah. <laughs> Um, I so I started Ladies Get Paid at the organization in 2016, um, and part of starting it really was my kind of rage uh, and frustration um, reading about statistics around the wage gap and the leadership gap and the investing gap and the funding gap and all the gaps were so depressing because I felt like as an individual, what could I possibly do, right, to combat something that is so overwhelming and systemic. And the feeling was, well, if I could at least learn how to negotiate my salary, right, like could I close my own wage gap? And what about other women? Were, were they negotiating? Like it, it was the place to begin. Uh, and, and long story short, I just started to host events for women to come together and talk. These town halls, 
around what's what does money mean to you? Um, worth, do you know your worth? Are you advocating for your worth? And, and maybe most importantly, are you being recognized? And part of that was going across the country. Um, women, I started in New York. I had women all over the country asking me to come host town halls uh, in their cities. I went to 19 cities. This was right after the presidential election. Very interesting. And part of all of that was getting to hear these stories and getting to have this sort of bird's eye view of what women, not just what they wanted, but really what did they need at work? Um, how did they feel about their work? And all along the way, I was inviting them into a Slack group. So we use Slack uh, as a way of connecting. And since 2016, we now have over 50,000 women in Slack. They've exchanged more than 2 million messages. The book came about because I eavesdropped on these. <laughs> we just watched. We really see what did these women say and how can we develop programming, right? At educational content that delivers exactly what they need. And I did get the opportunity uh, to write a book. I, it was brought to me, which I felt very lucky. Uh, although I always want to caution us, let's not always say how lucky we are, because guess what? We created our own opportunities here. So I feel, you know, I have gratitude uh, for it. And there is a longer story and a shocking story that does come along with how the book agent came about. Uh, but, you know, that that's the very long story short. OK, well, I mean, as I said, I think what makes the book so compelling is that it, they are real life stories. And we know as women, telling our story is really important. It's, it's you know, giving us power, it's giving us a voice, it's giving, taking ourselves seriously. So I'd love that you use that as the basis of your, um, of your research, if you were, will. And um, who would you say the target audience for this book is? Um, yeah. Um, I started with myself, you know, I created Ladies Get Paid because I needed Ladies Get Paid. I'm almost 35. Um, I started it four years ago. I, I found a lot of the women, my peers, they were at some kind of inflection point where they had worked long enough to know their value. They had a sense of who they, who they are, but they were looking at leadership going, well, that doesn't look like me. Mm -hmm. And I guess it was them experiencing, right, the glass ceiling for the first time. And because so many of these women, you know, are millennials, I feel like we were kind of raised to believe that there was no more glass ceiling, right? That that was shattered by women like my mother who was in the second or third class of women in her college, right? Well, now we know that that's sort of silly, right? It was how sweet and naive we were into early 2016, late 2015. So, um, you know, so most of the women were around my age uh, when it began, it still is. I find a lot of the women that join and the women who read this book, again, are at an inflection point, but it could be the beginning of their career. It could be, I've stayed home with my kids. I want to come back. It could be, listen, I'm, you know, I don't want to retire, but maybe multiple income streams or there's a change that somebody wants to make. But I would say between, you know, 24 and 36, if I had to choose. Mm -hmm. Well, I would just want to say, and I, I think I mentioned this to you that, I think the book is great for the user who wants to actually implement, um, you know, your suggestions and there are all kinds of great charts and suggestions, but it's also wonderful for someone like me who wants to mentor younger yes. people. And it really gives, you know, a roadmap, if you will, that you can encourage um, young people to, to follow. And quite frankly, as I said earlier, learn something, you know, uh, myself. And so, it's, uh, I really think the audience, it can be very, very broad. And, um, you know, I, I, I love that. Uh, I understand where you started, but it can be for younger and, and for older women. Um, Claire, you focus on like the personal work people have to do and also the structural work. I, can, you, can you talk about that? I think that's a very special, you know, since you rooted in personal stories, you could have just stayed there, but you, you went to the structural as well. So if you could talk about that. Sure, yeah, and I'll just give a quick overview of how the book itself is structured. So I knew that I wanted it to be almost like a guide from the beginning of your career towards, you know, ascension, whatever that means to you, right? And so looking at the chronology of a career, how could I show individuals, each of them going through a professional challenge, that's reflected in the chronology of a career, right? So I found these women in my community and that's actually what took the longest was finding the right 
stories. And they were very honest. Every single thing in the book is true with the exception of three names that were changed. So when you read it and if it's shocking, it happened. Um, and, and as they're going through these experiences, I kind of stop along the way and I give advice almost as if I'm like career coaching them in real time. Mm -hmm. I knew from the beginning, and it's just like why I started Ladies Get Paid, this had to be structural. I mean, it, I would be doing a disservice if I taught one woman how to negotiate her salary. I may have changed her life, but that did nothing to help all women. And if I do nothing to help all women, then it's like I'm just running on a treadmill here. Like that's, it just sort of seemed irresponsible not to address the bigger picture. But again, mm -hmm. of course, what do I actually do when I know the bigger picture and it's terrible? How do I do this? How do I present it in a way that doesn't depress people, right? Gives them an action to take. And it's a little bit more expanded when the paperback comes out in January, but towards the end, I have, um, I do have stories of women who were able to make policy changes at their company, um, both in terms of paid family leave and equal pay. And then at the end, an appendix, here are policy, federal policies, right? Um, that could help close some of these gaps. And then organizations that are specific to tackling those policies, because that's not what ladies get paid does. We equip women kind of with the tools and the talking points to self-advocate. Um, and then I wanted to draw attention for, you know, if it's universal child care, where are the groups, where are the nonprofits really, you know, fighting for that? So maybe, you know, I wish that part was longer, but it's already 320 pages of the book. So I kind of had to stop at some point. Yeah. Well, I mean, but I think, I, I just think it's a great, you know, um, marrying the two ideas of, you know, there's a personal journey, but there's a larger journey. So, so you can impact, you know, more women and, and, and the structure of, of how work happens. I think at the core of what you're talking about in the book is the wage gap. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about where we are and certainly the different maybe divisions between women um, and, and, and just to set sort of the stage, why all this work is necessary. Yeah, the statistic that really motivated me to do something was discovering that Hispanic women make 55 cents to the dollar. I had heard of the wage gap. I had thought, you know, I'd heard of 78, 80 cents on the dollar, which it is as an aggregate. I wasn't aware that if you break it down um, by lots of different, you know, whether you've got children or not, if you're single or not, obviously your ethnicity. Um, people weren't really talking about it much in 2014, 2015, when I began, you know, an awakening happened. And I was really ashamed that I didn't know that statistic. And I sort of felt like, well, maybe other people don't know, because if they knew, wouldn't we all be doing something about, like, we'd be talking about it which mm. now we are, then mm. we weren't. And, and so it's interesting, that was the specific statistic. Um, I always say about the wage gap, it's complicated and it's also not. <laughs> it's complicated in the sense that there are a lot of nuances. This is when online, you know, I'll get trolled. It doesn't exist, you know, and here's why. And it's like, okay, yes, in some capacities, it does, it's barely exists, right? Like one or 2%, I, I hear you, but there are other issues, particularly just a quick overview of the wage gap. The wage gap is really large within an organization and also between industries. But here, and this is the kind of the, the tricky part, within an organization, there's a wage gap oftentimes because the women have roles that are simply compensated less, right, mm -hmm. than the men. The men are often in sales roles, right, in software engineering, those we've decided should get paid more, okay? And then in industry, caregivers, retail workers, service workers, those tend to be, you know, nurses. These tend to be, you know, female dominated industries. And as a society, we've decided let's pay those people less. Okay. So that's why when we talk about the wage gap, it's not just math. It's also why have we decided that we're mm -hmm. going to value certain kind of work differently than other kinds of work. Um, and that, and that's when it's like, you get real back and forth and I don't engage in, in the trolls, but that's where, you know, um, and so, you know, I just want to urge women, and this is why I wrote beyond just the wage gap in the negotiation chapter, it's really holistic. It's thinking, okay, am I, you know, just taking this job because I was able to get it? Am I thinking bigger than just this job? What, what's stopping me from going into an industry that's male dominated? What can I do to make change there? How do I really dig into my impact at work? Because if you can demonstrate that you've made money for the company, you are in a much better position for a raise and a promotion. And it's harder for women to show that because they are often in the roles that are using the quote soft skills, 
So that's where I'm saying I like wish the book could have been longer in some sense because there is so much more to talk about. But yeah, it's within an organization, it's across industries. And you know, you're if you are not white, you there's a lot of problems there. Yeah. Just to give you a little perspective, when I was in college or coming up out of college, it was 59 cents um, for women, white women, um, yeah. to every dollar that the, the men made. So we've made some progress. But as you say, um, within, you know, the different uh, diversity of women, there's just so much work to be done. Um, and also for sure. I, I always want to remind people is when you when you look at progress, right, it tends to go up, but it's not guaranteed. OK, it's not right. linear. And so and this is a part that I think a lot of women forget so much progress was made in the 70s and the 80s. And actually, it became quite stagnant and went down in the 90s mm -hmm. uh, for other. You know, I can talk a lot about that. But um, and then, of course, the pandemic. So which put a lot of us back. So it's like it gets better, but it's like, let's not get complacent here. Um, and by the way, I, you know, I know I'm speaking to women, but the people we really need to speak to are men. But I acknowledge that <laughs> we start with us. Right. Um, throughout the book, you do talk about women of color, and I, I really appreciate that. Do you want to just tease that out a little more about, you know, some of the challenges and, um, you yeah. know, uh, because we're particularly concerned about, you know, uh, all, all women, but but particularly where the, the discrepancies are so high. And yeah, and that is where the discrepancies, I mean, if you're looking at full time, you know, white collar, you know, six figure white women, like the wage gap's pretty small. There's an issue with leadership. So it's not really us that I'm that worried about. I think we're going to be okay. Um, it's oftentimes actually the hourly workers um, that have the biggest uh, problem here. So I hired from day one uh, a woman in my community who specializes in um, diversity and inclusion work. She um, became one of my editors. It's called a, a sensitivity reader, something I really encourage authors advocate for that at your publisher. Now, my publisher, Simon & Schuster, is like they're going to hire her again, which is great. I wanted her there from the beginning to the end of this book process because I wanted to make sure that when I talked about women of color, A, it was coming from a really empathetic place. And also that it wasn't just in parentheses, right? And worse for women of color, where they where they were really like woven into the fabric of the book and not as this like aside or add on. Cause that's something I found actually with a lot of other career books. And I, and I didn't like that. Um, and I ended up actually integrating this woman into my book as one of the characters. I did mm -hmm. change the name. So as she was reading, she said, let me tell you, I have a story. Um, and the reason I think it's so important beyond that, we just all, you know, I think the progress we've made has only been as much as those who still struggle as much, you know, among us, but also that we have to be very careful about the advice that we give you. I, I think if I just say, act like a man, that's actually quite dangerous advice for women in general, because we will be penalized for appearing aggressive actually, but that's really bad for women of color. Okay. So the way that they have to approach the workplace is already so tough. And so just as somebody who gives any kind of career advice, it really needs to be contextualized. And part of that is understanding the barriers that they're facing, you know, in the day-to-day -day interactions and not just the systemic ones. Well, you know, it's interesting. One of your stories is about, um, I think, Alicia. Um, I, I think she was a white woman, but, but I think is yeah. relevant. What? She's actually not. She's not. Okay. Yeah. But, oh yeah, she's Korean. But yeah. what I thought was so interesting about that, and maybe some of the, the participants who are watching today might feel the same thing. I think there's a different kind of pressure on people of color, particularly if they're in you know, a school like NYU Law School or getting an advanced degree to follow a very particular path that's going to be financially, you know, renew very, very good for them. Their families work so hard. So you want to talk a little bit about Alicia's story, which I think is just wonderful um, and, and could be helpful to some of our, our listeners. She, she was a speaker at my first town hall that I did in Washington, D.C. Um, and, and I can tell you who she is. Uh, her name is Alicia Ramos. She so she went to Harvard um, and had this like dream of going into writing, journalism, like she wanted to be, she loved Barbara Walters, but pretty quickly when she gets there, she thinks, well, that's not a serious profession. Interestingly enough, actually, she didn't really get much pressure from her parents 
she really brought it on herself. Internal, she internalized it. Yeah. 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 And she was looking at her, you know, I was gonna say colleagues, but I guess when you're in college, it's not a student, I guess, <laughs> her soon to be colleagues. And all of a sudden, like investment banks and consultancies just like descended on campus and were recruiting everybody, all of her friends, right? And so then it became this very competitive, like, are you getting an offer? Are you getting an offer? And she just gets swept up, even though instinctually she knows that deep down she wants to write, but she just keeps pushing it away, pushing it away and had this like sick feeling from day one. Like she knew this wasn't her path that she should go on, but she felt like she couldn't justify journalism for her. And so, yeah, so she took a job at a consultancy and ends up totally getting burnt out and then starts her own thing, becomes a freelancer and really explores, you know, in the book, I talk about the steps she takes because I do not want to tell people just quit your job. Like, I don't want that responsibility because I don't know your finances. Uh, so I really appreciated within her story. I felt like it was, um, calculated risk, every decision that she made. And then ultimately she has started her own company, um, uh, called Girls Night In, which I highly recommend everybody check out. And it is really about self-care because mm. she got so burnt out from the pressure she put on herself and also choosing a career path that just wasn't right. So she had to sort of contort herself to be somebody else. And that was exhausting on top of all the, all the work that she was doing. Right, right. Um, yeah, no, no, no. I mean, you talk a lot about finding that, that fit for yourself. Um, often employers talk about finding the fit with the, the, the candidate, but um, you've, you've turned it around, which I think is really important, you know, for, for young people just starting, it might take them a little while to, to really know what that is. But um, I, I, I really think that kind of, you know, uh, advocating for yourself, trying to figure out a plan and, and not giving up, you know, mostly because people have to work, but also that they're, that it's, baby steps can can make a big difference. Isn't that one of the, the messages of your book? Yeah. And I think also we just need more information and by information, I mean exposure. So, you know, and I talked about this in the book for, for myself, I, I might, I started my career first producing a film, but going into development at a nonprofit, becoming a fundraiser. And the only reason I even knew what that job was, was because I was lucky enough for my mom to tell me, I had been mm -hmm. fundraising in high school, but I didn't know there was like a job and what that title was. So that's really, to me, the next steps are, where can I gather information about right. what's out there? And that's also why the networking chapter, I think is, if you had to pick one chapter in the book, I think the best advice, you, I think it's the networking chapter because to your point earlier of wanting to mentor, right? Everything comes from your relationships. Even right. if it's just, hi, my name is Claire and I have this organization and then you read about the organization and then that connects you to something else. So right. I, I think people really need exposure on top of the therapy work, you know, the internal internalizing, mm -hmm. you know, that I, I sort of go into in the book. Yeah, well, networking just in general is something that you have to actually teach or people have to learn it. Um, and, you know, many of us who, you know, um, like I have children who I, you know, I can, I can help them network. I can teach them the value, but, you know, first generation people, they just, it, so it's very, very important. Um, and I wish more like high schools would do that as well as colleges and, and all of that. Um, so I totally agree that is a indispensable skill. And, you know, some people feel guilty about it, but um, as you mentioned in the book, but it is, it is, a proven um, tool in your toolkit, if you will. Um, I wanted to go back to a point you made about talking to men. Um, is that, is there, I, I, I didn't really see anything in the book about that because so, there's so much to talk to women about, but, but do you have any thoughts on that and how we can get these messages out to not only other women, but to, to, to the men as well? So something that I, I have since added to my negotiation class, so it's not in the book, uh, is I think a great way to figure out how much to charge or what your salary could be is to actually get connected to men, white men in particular, right? Because they make the most. And that could just be on LinkedIn, finding somebody who has a similar job, similar company, because compensation is contextual, and reaching out and saying, I'm concerned about the wage gap. And part of that is I've you know challenged myself to reach out to start the dialogue with men. Uh, you don't have to tell me your salary. I did some research. 
is this a ballpark of what you make? Would you be willing to share that? That really, that makes, you'd be a great ally. So you kind of, you know, cause a lot of them are really looking for ways to help and they just don't know. They don't, they don't know. And I understand that. So that's a great place to be in. Um, and also when I, you know, talk to men, it's like, just ask, how can I support you? Cause a lot right. of times they feel like they need to do something. And that often could mean doing the wrong thing or speaking for somebody or over somebody. Um, so I would say, you know, sharing your salary, sharing negotiation tactics, and then connecting. Meaning if there's a woman who you believe in, making sure she's considered for a role mm -hmm. uh, or connecting her to somebody else who can give her, like I said, kind of the, the exposure, right? I also had a, a great mentor who became a boss, my boss, um, where he would just invite me to events. He mm -hmm. would, you know, and, and oftentimes, you know, hi, have you met Claire? And then he would right. walk off and always introducing me. And sometimes he and I would connect, you know, go out to have a coffee or whatever, and he'd be finishing a meeting with somebody else, but he'd have me come 10 minutes early. So he oh, could introduce that's great. me. So yeah. easy. It's like so easy to do and it can go so far. So I think that's a really great place to start. Yeah, no, I, I that that's great. And I think, you know, again, from a mentoring perspective, to have a male mentor is not necessarily bad. It's, it's I think we like having women mentors, but, you know, having having a male is sometimes very helpful. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about the salary negotiation? Because that I know is such a central part of the book. And I know so many women. I just had an experience where we just hired somebody and she asked for more money than we offered. And we, we met her sort of in the middle and she said, I'm so sorry that I did that. And, you know, it was classic. It was right out of your book. So can you, can you talk about that a little bit? Oh, no, not the yeah. sorry. Yeah, no, uh, sorry. No, sorry. Unless you really messed up, like, save and it, she right? didn't, she right. didn't, we were so, if she hadn't done it, we would have been upset. But anyway, um, I, there's a lot of layers to this, you know, mm -hmm. starting with how we're socialized, right? So what's this fear of you even asking? Uh, and it's, I don't want to be rejected. I don't want to jeopardize my relationship. I've been, you know, socialized to be accommodating and nice. Right. And I just remind everybody it's expected. Negotiation is an expected part of the process. Yeah. The offer is given to you knowing that they will probably have to go higher. So that's yeah. the first place, right? How do we like shift our mindset here? And also knowing that, you know, you may feel quote lucky, like I mentioned this before, but they're feel lucky too. Like everybody already is on the same page and wants this to work. So mm -hmm. coming in with that, um, I think doing as much research as possible. So not going to Glassdoor and stopping at Glassdoor really talking to real people, as many people as possible, and then coming in with multiple numbers. Because that's another thing. I think, you know, I've read statistics. Uh, first, I've read statistics that women don't ask as much as men. I think there's been more recent studies that say we do ask as much as men, but we don't get the yes. Part of that, I think, is that we don't have what I call a comeback number. That's, a, I also don't have that in the book, the comeback number, where if we get a no, okay, how about this number? Or how mm -hmm. about full compensation? Understanding that you can negotiate for things other than money. I think we just get nervous. We, we ask and then they say, no, we say, oh, I'm sorry. Like, okay. Like you already regret it. Right. And that's, you know, the negotiation doesn't end in the first conversation, right? It should continue to a certain point. So having multiple numbers that you're mm -hmm. ready and willing to be negotiated down to just have that in the back of your mind. And then the other thing um, that I don't think enough of us really dig into is remembering that it is not about you and the hard work that you do because you're expected to do hard work. It's really how do you affect the business bottom line? Mm -hmm. Really digging into that. And that is hard. And I mentioned this earlier, if you are in a role where that's not obvious, right? If you're in a role where you can say, I brought in X dollars from this client or whatever, like, okay, now we can see it. We can visualize it. So what happens if you're in a role that's a little bit more abstract, like I think sort of abstract, right? Well, you have to get creative in making the case. And that could be the time that you saved. You mentored people. Think about now they've done better. They're more productive, right? Maybe you negotiated discounts, right? So there's other ways to think about impact. And that I find is not taught enough. It doesn't just, it's not just about the numbers and the research. You really have to make a compelling case why you were asking for that number. So, you know, again, it's longer, it's all in the book, but I would say the, the biggest points is talk to as many people as possible, come with more than one number and really dig into your impact. 
Um, one last thing I just want to say quickly off of that, because this is a mindset shift I, I have found a lot of people told me is really helpful, is to imagine that you're a business and when you go to negotiate, you are pitching investors on why they should invest in your business. Mm -hmm. It's not mm -hmm. a charity. This is not a favor. Okay. Right. But here's the thing. How do I convince an investor to invest in me? Well, I show him how they're going to make money. Also, right. by the way, did you hear me just say him? I did, I, I assume, I imagined an investor as a man. So that's interesting, but I, you know, and so that, and also it's about long-term growth, right? They see how, okay, over time, how is this person, this company going to grow, right? What's their vision? How can I get them sold on their vision? So it's about ideas. I have, people have told me that's really helpful. Um, so I hope for those listening that that is, that is helpful for you too. Another thing I always tell people, your interview, well, this is not really salary negotiation, but, and you have this in the book, you're interviewing them and, and as well as them interviewing you. So you, you go in with some power, um, particularly if you're negotiating with salary, because you know, they want more you, but I, I think to give, to give the, the, the candidate or, or the person some, some sense that it's not all about, you know, it's all not all or nothing that you do have some power and they want you, but you know, you still have to work this out. Um, I, um, I, I wanted to, to, to also pick up on the point you just made about the other things women particularly do in the office, you know, the mentoring, the pro bono work, uh, some, and how that, is an important part of the contributions you're making. So I, I don't know if you want to just elaborate on that. Um, yeah, um, you know, thinking again, like as if you're a business, so imagine that you're running the company, what would you want to see your employees do, right? How, how can they improve the company culture? Uh, so if you are doing that, for example, if you've been at the company for a while, you have institutional knowledge and you're sharing that knowledge with people and that's shortening the learning curve for them. And when the learning curve is shortened, that means things get done faster, right? And if they get done faster, then the company will grow quicker, right? So you got to work backwards from how does the company benefit from its employees? And it's not just the work that they put out, it's how they work. Um, and you can make a case for it. I mean, you know, it's good to talk to your manager. So you even just ask them, I want to have a really good understanding of, you know, my overall impact here, you know, the dynamic that I bring to the team. Um, so if you're not quite sure, like figure out who you can talk to. Um, one quick story from the book is there was a woman who, you know, started an employee resource group for parents. Uh, she was able to enact, you know, a better paid family and bereavement policy. And she did it because she was like me concerned about the overall, you know, the structure. Um, but she also used that as leverage to ask for a raise and a promotion because what she did benefited the business. That's and she right. thought specifically in that when they enacted these policies, pretty soon after their competitor company also enacted those policies. So she saw, ah, this is how they get talent. If this is about, you know, attracting and retaining talent, think about how much money goes into that. Now she couldn't translate it to an exact dollar amount, but she could make the case. And, and the answer was yes. So I'm just giving away the end of her chapter, but you know, the answer is yes, she gets a raise in promotion. And not only that, a portion of her job responsibilities moving forward was specifically dedicated to the employee resource group. And the end of all of this is she got recruited away to work for a company that is specific to helping companies improve their policies. So she totally changed her job, changed her life. And I just get goosebumps because she like is the living embodiment of like the story that I'm trying to tell. So I, you know, her name's Sarah. And again, I gave away the end of her chapter, but I encourage you to read the chapter anyway. <laughs> uh, you do have one personal story where things did not work out. Do you want to, you know, want to talk about that? I mean, you know, because most of the stories in the book are success stories, but, you know, the, the one where the woman had to sue them. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. Well, I can tell you who it is now because okay. she's come out with it. So in the book, her name is, I believe, Madeline. That is not her name. Her, her name is actually Lauren, Lauren Bonner. Yeah, Madeline. Yeah. yeah, so I changed some details there, but if you Google her, there's you know New York Magazine, New Yorker, there's been a lot of articles. So she was working for 0.72. So she's working for Steve Cohen, okay? Big investor, scary, scary. She, and she was on the talent side, not a recruiter, but she was on the talent side. She had access to compensation. 
And she saw that systematically the women were paid less. And, and really egregious because she knew who these men were and the caliber of work they were doing. And she just said, there's no justification for this. So she went and tried to negotiate a raise. It was a very small raise and just kept getting pushed back. The environment was really, you know, I, I, I actually did not go into detail in the chapter because my editor said, this is too much. <laughs> She's like, this is like, people aren't going to believe it. Really, really sexist. And so then she makes the really tough decision. She is going to sue them. The very tough decision because she really went through, you know, she said she developed like a war room in her living room, all the cases, right? If I do this, what will happen here? What will happen there? And she, you know, her decision was, I am a privileged person and I will be okay. Whatever happens, like I have money and I can do this. She sues them for pay discrimination and sexism, gender discrimination, excuse me, and they don't fire her. So she worked there while she's suing them until eventually she's put on leave or I don't know the exact details. So part of this was, yes, the decision, you know, uncovering it, questioning her value. Like maybe I'm not as good as these men, right? She went to Harvard, but she's thinking, oh, you know, maybe they went to a better school. It was not justified, but she wondered maybe it was her. And then all the way through with the decision and then staying there. And now she has her own investment fund and she's been able to come public. It took, uh, took at least two years, they countersued her. So she really, you know, did a big service, I think, for the women in the finance industry. We have a, a, a comment in the question. It, is, it says, Laura Bonner, is she the face of Me Too? I mean, has she been involved in the Me Too movement? I think so. Yeah. She's had articles that say, like, you know, is this the Me Too of finance? Because she's right. really the only one. And she tried to get allies. She went around, she said, will anybody stand with me? And they said, absolutely not. Because this is an industry that is entirely built on relationships. That's mm -hmm. how it yeah. is. Yeah. Um, all right. I am going to ask you one more question, but I want to invite the audience to, to ask some questions. So go to the Q&A um, you know, at the bottom of your screen and please pose some questions and, and we can have uh, Claire answer them. I have one more question. You address it in the book briefly, but I think it would be interesting to hear you talk about it. Why ladies? Why, why did you talk about ladies? Yeah, uh, the book I, is Ladies Get Paid. The organization is Ladies Get Paid. So I thought it was an interesting choice that you used the word ladies. Yes, and it was very specific. So by the way, I just posted the article about Lauren because the person who asked, I think you knew what that article was because it was. Yes, awesome. there she is, the face of me too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's great. Which is interesting because that came out in 2018, but she didn't want me to publicly put her name in the book, but now she's allowed me to talk about it. So um, I chose ladies because, well, I, much longer story, but I had only 24 hours to make a decision on the name of this company. So I was like, you know, I had this big deadline and it really just came to me, this phrase. Then I thought about it. Do I really like ladies? Like, will I stand by ladies? And I, and I thought, well, women felt they didn't have like the sense of humor that I wanted and have like the cheekiness I felt, felt very, you know, girls, definitely not that we're not, you know, that felt too diminutive. Ladies get paid. It also is, well, what do we think of as a lady stereotypically? Right. And I talk about this in the book, the white gloves, yeah. nice, you know, maybe be seen, not heard. And that is so much of the work that I do is dismantling is first identifying and then doing our best to either dismantle or work through a lot of how we're socialized. And then it gets to, okay, strategically, what are we doing here? So the tongue in cheek of it just made sense. And the get paid part um, really encompassed kind of what I want for women is like, get what you want, get what you deserve, get, you know, and paid to me meant power. It meant more than just money, though, of course, we started with negotiation. So, and then the URL was available. So for anybody who has ever come up with an idea, you of course search can I buy the domain and can I get the social handles? And the answer was yes, it was all available. It was $12. So I'm not changing the name. It is ladies get paid. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah, well, now we're getting, we're getting a couple. Um, yes. And there's a link, I think, to, to, to purchase the book. And I highly, highly recommend it. We're getting some questions from the audience. And I think this is a great one. Um, will you discuss women who work in the trades and blue collar workers like non Wall Street type folks? I do know that in the book you talk about the nonprofit world, but I think this is a little different, different question. Yeah. So it, it's really interesting. This is something that I think a lot about my the group that I, you know, that I help 
is women who are not those workers. Okay, these are tend to be white collar workers. Um, I help those women because that's where I started. That's what I knew. That's what I had access to. Okay, but is that going to move the needle in the way that we need to when it comes to the wage gap? No, as we talked about earlier. It will move the needle when it comes to the leadership gap, and that is huge, especially because leadership at companies can decide to have policies around paid leave and universal child care. And that's that's really what's actually going to move the needle is those are those policies. So in the book, I, I don't speak specifically to blue collar to hourly. And I have some guilt over it because I know, again, back to the beginning of the conversation, I know that that's where like real change has to happen. But that's not for that's not my expertise. So I go back and forth uh, a lot on it. So maybe, you know, the next book. Are they do you are you aware of other organizations that that might be addressing this or are there, you know, probably a need for other organizations? Um, I don't I can't think of anyone off the top of my head. I mean, we did an event with Dress for Success. So that's, you know, started there. They were doing a lot of content around getting women back into the workforce. Um, but I'm, yeah, I don't know any off the top of my head. I'm sure that there are, are many though, because they often get grants. We're not a nonprofit, yeah. so we're not getting grants, but they have right. funding, you know. Yeah. Um, you know, one one of the uh, attendees says, well, unions have leadership and it'll be interesting to look at sort of the gender dynamics um, of union leadership and uh, and the like. So okay, that's uh, pretty new. Yeah, that's that's. Yeah, um, but and and a lot of the unions are made up of you know women of color who are doing the jobs, so you know the the disparities uh, continue. Um, so other questions, we have time for a couple. So please please ask. Um, one of the things that uh, you talk about, which I think is um, is is really important, is uh, not. I think you mentioned it earlier. Not stopping it no that that you have to keep pushing yourself and moving forward and planning so I maybe you could talk a little more about that um you know uh I think you go through things like imposter syndrome syndrome perfectionism in the book and 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 how do you how do you sort of uh help people with the, with those issues which many of us particularly overqualified women, you know, we always think we're, we're faking it and, uh, you know, we have to be perfect and all of that. So maybe you could speak about that a little more. That was the universal that I found. So when I went across the country and I'm, we were having like 200 person events, you know, so, and in places like one night was Detroit, Michigan, the next night was Grand Rapids, Michigan. So I would see in two very different cities in the same state, was there a connection or did they have totally different, you know, challenges? the connection was always imposter syndrome and perfectionism, mm -hmm. always. Mm -hmm. um, and that's also at the beginning of a lot of this, which is, you know, if I'm teaching you how to advocate for yourself, well, first you have to believe, deeply believe that you're worthy of the advocacy. So it's sort of like, all right, can't build the house until you get the foundation. Um, I also, you know, let me talk about imposter syndrome for a second. When I wrote this book, whew, I was really going through it. Something that has helped, well, first I, I just define it as, you know, this feeling like you are a fraud and you'll be found out, right? Or you don't deserve to be in the room. Perfectionism, right? This belief, this binary belief, there is only failure or success. And, you know, anything less than success is, is a failure, right? And the issue with both of them, because I think that they're sort of two sides of the same coin, is that your value and identity is based on how somebody else perceives you to a certain extent right? That it, it depends on somebody else saying good job or getting, you know, if you're told yes for the negotiation, you know, maybe you feel better about yourself. If you're told no, then you question your worth. So it means we have to be very confident in who we are outside of kind of the participation of other people, which is very hard. And also that we don't construct our identities based on what we do, right? Which is also very hard, right? We are not our work even though I feel that way. Okay. So that's, there's so much to unpack there. Um, the first step I always have women do when they're struggling with imposter syndrome is let's just find the patterns here of when you feel this way. So specifically, I mean, for two weeks, anytime you're having these feelings of don't speak up in the meeting, stupid idea, right? Or, you know, what are they going to think? Whatever it is, writing it down and writing down all the details around that experience, like who was there, 
right? What was the triggering event to this thing? And then you might be able to isolate it. Ah, I tend to have this feeling when this certain person maybe makes me feel this way, right? Or wow, it's because I actually don't really like my job. <laughs> like Alicia realizing, wow, I'm exhausted because I actually don't think this is the right job for me. So first, you know, sort of getting objective about the whole thing is, is really important. Um, something also, you know, with perfectionism, um, and I know I'm sort of going back and forth here, uh, it's to first acknowledge how is it working for you? Because it is to a certain extent. That's why you hold on to it or how you believe it's working for you. And then it's saying, okay, if I let this go, what am I afraid will happen? What's the probability that that will actually happen? And then at the very end of this, what's the consequence if I were to keep holding on to this perfectionism or even imposter syndrome? The exhaustion that I feel, the I'm holding my team to unrealistic standards and it's you know hurting the team dynamic or whatever. And then you simply say, do I trust myself that without the perfectionism, I will still do a great job? Actually, and one person said to me, she said, go for the A minus. Because your A minus is probably still like light years ahead of everybody else's, you know. Uh, and so that's I just said a whole bunch of stuff there. Uh, but one thing I would wrap that up with is something that has helped me, especially with the book writing process, was shifting the focus from will people like this book? Will they? Will I get on a bestseller list? You know, will I get canceled? Right? To why am I writing this? Who am I writing this for? Can I find enjoyment in my writing, even just forgetting about the end of all of this? Today, can I challenge myself to write in the moment? Can I be present, right? So when I broke it down in that way and I focused a little bit more on my values and kind of the skills and the experience that I was having, it really just like opened everything up for me and it it kind of became fun. It was still really hard and horrible yeah. for people working on this, let me be clear. But it did, that was a big shift that I had when I realized that. Okay, we have another question. When you witness that a male is given preference at work, what do you think is an effective way to approach this inside the organization? How do you speak up? That's hard because I don't know, like there's so many, there's so many nuances to like that happening and also what the relationship is. I, I get asked often about, I know this person got a raise or is being paid more than me. I feel like we do the same job. How do I bring it up? Um, I think it's really, I mean, in this case, really understand like what's the work that they're doing? Are they doing certain projects or having certain opportunities that get them more exposure? So in the book, I talk about this thing called glamour work. I didn't make that up. It's called glam work. And men are oftentimes given opportunities where they have face time with clients, or they get invited into rooms with influential people, or they work on projects that can be more directly tied to, you know, the money that's made for the company that they can now leverage when they make their case. So I would kind of, you know, really break this down and go, am I do, what kind of work are they doing? And am I doing the kind of work that gets recognized and rewarded? And if I'm not, how can I create that opportunity for myself? Also, does your manager know? all the great work that you're doing. I think oftentimes we just put our heads down, we work hard and we assume that that's enough. Well, it's not, I think, if this person's getting preferential treatment. So how do you consistently let them know what you're doing? So you're not waiting for the, let's have a conversation about my annual you know, review. Every, you know, sending them, an, forwarding an email when you get, have a win or, you know, good feedback, letting them know, hey, in the last two weeks, here's a rundown of some things that I did because guess what? That's reminding them that they're doing a good job because this, their success is contingent on their team. So understanding the opportunities that this person has, creating your own, keeping the boss posted uh, on, on what you're doing. And I think um, having allies, making sure that you have really strong relationships with other people, particularly people of influence at the company, because ultimately you may not be working for the manager. You may wanna move, depends, but that's a personal choice, obviously. Um, I have another just quick question, and it comes from my, my experience. Um, I've worked for some very difficult women in the past, you know, so it's not just men who are, and there. when I was a young lawyer, I used to look at the, the women partners and I'd say, first of all, they were just nasty, 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 had no lives. Um, so I, I would love for you to talk about a little bit about working for difficult women and if, if that's something uh, you have something to say about, 
but also talking about self-care. And, and, and that's the other thing, because I, I used to look at these women and they never stopped and they never. And I just thought I, that's not that's not what I want for myself. And I can't imagine that's good for them. So it just spoke those topics. If you. Oh, I know that. that's like totally breaks my heart. And it's very much what I hear from legal profession and in the yeah. particularly lawyers. Um, and that's why a lot of, I think women do churn out because first of all, we're the default caretakers. So it's really hard to do everything anyway. And also why would we, why would anybody want that? I guess you get paid enough to, you know, suffer. Uh, it's interesting. I found in my, in my tour across the country, LA, which now I live in, although I'm here in Washington, DC, um, LA was where the women really talked about women being mean to other women. And I thought, what, what is it about the city? And mm. I realized it's because these women were mostly in fashion, PR and talent. And these are industries uh, that are really dominated by women, but not in leadership. Not in leadership. Yeah. Yeah. Not in leadership. Whereas other industries aren't necessarily dominated by women. They're still male in leadership, but there's more of us in middle management, maybe even upper management. Okay. But these women, they were all still being crushed down but they were all of them. And so they felt like they needed to be really competitive with each other. And what it felt like, and this is what I've heard, it felt almost like other generations where there was only room for so many people at the top for them. Because again, I think it was just so male. They're, they're just having a squeeze in those industries in a way that I haven't seen in others. Because when women do come and tell me that they had a particularly horrible boss, it tends to be a lot older. So I think things are changing. Yeah. Yeah, I think women sometimes really resent, you know, what they had to go, older women had to go through to get where they are. And they see younger women maybe having an easier or, or you know, being more empowered and coming to them, asking them for things and they get angry about it. Well, also, if you're part of a culture like a hazing culture, which also mm -hmm. was these women who are agent, you know, work in talent, um, probably in banking too, like there's like you have to, you know, you just haze the freshmen, you know, so there's also that culture, which is pretty male oriented, right? So that again goes back to like, why are we treating or paying certain roles a certain way? And why do certain industries have a hazing culture? Like, where does that come from? So that's why my work is very interesting, objectively very interesting, even though it's also really hard. The part of that yeah. self-care, and obviously, you know, there's a big chapter in the book. I would just say, don't wait until you're burnt out because then you have to like spend the effort to get back and learn how to have good habits. So I would say really learning to identify those warning signs um, and then integrating self-care every day in small ways. Like yeah. I know that every four and a half hours, I get, I like my brain just stops working. I know that about myself. So every four and a half hours, I'm going to go for a walk or have some chocolate or, and so I'm not, that's not a big deal. That took me 10 minutes to take a break, but I, I'm aware of my energy. So that would be, I guess, my biggest suggestion off of the self-care question. Um, another question. I recently left public accounting because I wanted to pursue a PhD and study workplace culture. I'm very curious about how you transitioned from what you were doing before you founded Ladies Get Paid to your current role. Um, any tips on how to qualify yourself and feel qualified during a career pivot? It's a great question. I, yes. I've done that too. So yeah, so I'd love to hear, you know, Kathy, yeah. you have to say also for this person, if you want to message me, you know, find me on Instagram, Claire gets paid. Um, maybe we can have you come be a speaker or be part of it because you're, you know, I'm not academically trained to do this. So you are a professional. Um, I, you know, it's just remembering that when you are hired, you are hired for you as a whole human being. Okay. You fit into the team dynamic. So first really recognizing that it's not just your experience and your skills. So seeing, all right, what are my, like, who am I, my energy, my, am I detail oriented? Am I, you know, a cheerleader for the team? Like those are things that you should really talk about, talk up. I think it's the exposure question, sort of what I mentioned earlier, make sure you're talking to people who have the roles that you want and understanding the challenges that they face and how they solve those challenges uh, and what they wish they'd known at the beginning. Because the concern on the other side, the hiring side would be, okay, this person, the learning curve will be too steep here. They haven't seen the problems before. They don't have the network. Well, if you've really gone around and you've interviewed these people and we all like, people like to talk about themselves, you can specifically say, I have had conversations about what is hard for this job. I built a network. 
Um, that is that it's huge. It also shows that you, you know, are aware that this could be a deficit and you can proactively speak to it. Um, and then uh, that I mean, I would also really talk about times you've learned quickly. Because that's again, their their concern will be, did you learn quickly? And network, network. Because again, you're going to bring in your contacts, your experience, and ideas. That's how I was always able to move ahead or move up or move laterally. It's because I came with an idea for the business or for the team yeah. or whatever it was. So it was like, oh, she's unique. We gotta we gotta buy that idea, not just her. So I think mm -hmm. I bet just even showing that you're aware and you're working hard. And that being um, having the perspective of an outsider is unique and valuable. And, you know, fresh eyes, your experience, you have different experience that you can bring, you know, certain tools and talents to to something new. But I would also mention something that you do talk about in the book, Claire, having a community. I mean, you know, it's your networks, but also maybe making your own personal board of directors, you know, um, people who know you, people who know the, the new area you're going into that you feel you can consult with. I, I find when, um, you know, I was a lawyer and then I've done all this nonprofit work and now I'm running a small legal services organization. Um, I needed, uh, the, the, the community around me was really important and really helps me. Cause I don't, I uh, like you, I, what I like clear about your answers is you know, I'm, you're not an expert in everything. I'm not an expert in everything, but I bring, you know, a set of experiences and tools that can be applied to new things. And if I have some wisdom around me, you know, having that kind of community, I'm just much stronger and you'll just feel better about yourself. So, you know, creating that community. Claire has a wonderful scene at the beginning of the book where the women all meet in the bathroom um, and they're all talking to each other very much from the heart with real transparency about what's going on at a particular party and the community that they develop in the bathroom becomes like a, a savings grace. And so I, 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 that's, I, I think we're out of time. Is that right, Abby? Oh, oh one more thing. Yeah. Yeah, I thank you for reminding me of that because the question of why did you call it ladies get paid? It yeah. was also because the ladies room that was right. festival, at that yeah. festival, at that advertising festival, we all met in the bathroom. And that was part of my aha moment. This is amazing when we're all in here. And it was the ladies room. So thank you for telling yeah. that story. I forgot it. Good. It's such a wonderful story and basis for this book. And this has been such a wonderful conversation. Thank you both for being here tonight. Uh, and thank you to our audience for joining us. We really appreciate you coming in and sharing in this community that we are creating here at uh, our own little ladies room corner of the <laughs> internet now and world when we reopen. So thank you so much for all of your attendance. And also please feel free to attend our future events. So we have upcoming events throughout the fall, including a symposium, a full day symposium on the Marshall Plan for Moms with uh, Girls Who Code, and also another book talk in October on Feminist War on Crime. So we're very excited for all of these upcoming events. Thank you so much to tonight's author and moderator, Claire and Kathy. It was such a wonderful conversation and we're so excited to have you here. Thanks again.